chemistry. You already know that this is the study of matter and how matter changes. One type of change is when the matter changes physical state or phase. For example, when a gas condenses to a liquid. Right now, we'll take a look at how matter changes in chemical reactions. In this picture, you can see some iron filings, essentially pure iron. It has certain properties, for example, it's solid, it's grayish black, and it's magnetic. In this picture, we have a different substance, sulfur. You can see that it too is in its solid form, although it's yellow. Also, sulfur is not magnetic. Iron and sulfur are quite different substances with different properties. What happens if we mix them? Well, nothing more exciting happens than we get a mixture of iron and sulfur. You can see in this picture that there still are iron filings and sulfur powder in the mixture. Also, the iron and the sulfur still have their original properties. Iron is, for example, still magnetic, as you can see in this picture. But if you heat this mixture enough, things will start to happen. The sulfur reacts with the iron. You can see it in the lab because it glows and bursts and it becomes red hot too. And the stuff that's formed has different properties than the substances we started with. In this case, iron sulfide is formed. And that is what you see here to the right. The iron sulfide is not magnetic and it has properties that differ from iron and sulfur. This means there has been a chemical reaction and that a chemical compound between iron and sulfur has formed. But you're not supposed to just sit back and savor the beautiful images. It's time for you to take some notes too. Let's start by writing formation of iron sulfide up here and then we draw a watch glass with some iron filings on it. We also write that iron here has the chemical symbol Fe. To the right, we draw some sulfur the same way. And sulfur, we write that too, has the chemical symbol S. When we mix them, we get a mixture of iron and sulfur, somewhat yellow-grayish like this. But it is still just a mixture of iron and sulfur, and they still have their original properties. The iron, for example, is still magnetic. So if we introduce a magnet like this, it will attract some of the iron filings. But as I said, if we heat this mixture, stuff happens. A chemical reaction between iron and sulfur takes place and the mixture is transformed into a chemical compound. The properties of the chemical compound differ from those of the original substances. In this case, the chemical compound has a different color and it also isn't magnetic. This compound is called iron sulfide and it has the chemical formula FES. Now, we're going to use iron sulfide to discuss the differences between elements and chemical compounds. You write elements and chemical compounds too, and draw these small piles with iron sulfur and iron sulfide again. The iron sulfide that is formed here, it is a chemical compound with two different atomic species, iron and sulfur. Iron and sulfur, they are elements. That means that they only consist of a single atomic species each, iron atoms here and sulfur atoms here. The chemical compound, it is no longer a mixture of two substances, but a chemical compound. And since it is only iron sulfide and nothing else, we realize that iron sulfide is an example of a pure substance. And to be honest, so is the iron and so is the sulfur. They are pure substances because they only consist of iron and sulfur, respectively. We have to dig a little deeper into what a pure substance is. In a pure substance, there is only one type of chemical compound. Take this to your notes too. A pure substance may, for example, be iron sulfide, FES. But we can also talk about pure water, H2O. If a glass of water only contains water and nothing else, it is a pure substance. Pure gold, AU, only consists of gold atoms. It is also a pure substance. Pure sugar, which you can see in the picture here, consists only of sugar molecules, C12H22O11. All these are examples of different pure substances, some in chemical compounds and others, like the gold, as elements. A mixture is not the same thing as a chemical compound. 
What signifies a mixture is first that it consists of two or more substances, and second that the substances are relatively easy to separate from each other. And as we noted before, in a mixture, the substances in the mixture maintain their original properties. In the mixture of iron and sulfur that I showed earlier, the iron was still magnetic. And if we dissolve some sugar in water, the water will for example still taste sweet. Mixtures, they may be both homogeneous and heterogeneous. When the sugar is dissolved in the water here to the left, a homogeneous mixture is formed, a sugar solution. Homo means same, and that the solution is homogeneous means that it looks the same all the way through. That's different from a heterogeneous mixture. The fish soup, or bouillabaisse, as the French would say, is a good example of a heterogeneous mixture. Hetero means different, and you can clearly see different parts in the soup. There are some langoustines here, some mussels there, and a few croutons to go with that. So, let's write something about that too. Homogeneous mixtures, they look the same all the way through. Homogeneous mixtures may be both gases, liquid and solid. Normal, pure air is an example of a homogeneous gas mixture. Salt, dissolved in water, is a liquid homogeneous mixture. And bronze, which is an alloy between copper and tin, is an example of a solid homogeneous mixture. Or a solid solution, as you can also call it. Liquid homogeneous mixtures, that's what we normally call solutions. This mixture of salt and water is thus normally called a salt solution. Solid homogeneous mixtures are called alloys, exactly as I said about bronze over here. Now I've introduced a whole bunch of concepts, so let's draw an overview of the different forms of matter to sort them out. We write matter here at the top of a new page. Matter, it can exist either in the form of mixtures or as pure substances. Mixtures, as I said, can be either homogeneous or heterogeneous, and bouillabaisse is probably my favorite example of a heterogeneous mixture. The homogeneous mixtures are solutions of different kinds, and as an example of a solution, we can write cranberry juice here. It has the same red color in the glass everywhere you look. A special variety somewhere in between homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures are emulsions. Ordinary milk is homogenized. This means that the fat particles have been shared so they don't float to the surface but are dispersed throughout the milk. If you study some milk under the microscope, you may see the small droplets of fat. Because of this, the milk is not a completely homogeneous solution but rather an emulsion. Mayonnaise is another good example of an emulsion. Now, when we look at the pure substances, we can divide them into chemical compounds and elements. The chemical compounds can be either ionic compounds or molecular compounds, and precisely what those are, we'll look into later in the course. Right now, I'd just like to give you a couple of examples though, and that is that ordinary table salt with a chemical formula NaCl is an example of an ionic compound. And that water, H2O, is an example of a molecular compound. The elements come in a few different varieties too. There are metals, metalloids and non-metals. We'll study them closer further on, but I'll tell you already that metalloids are elements that have some metal properties but not all. Let's have some examples of that too. Iron with the chemical symbol Fe is a typical metal that I'm sure you are already familiar with. Sulfur, S, is a typical non-metal. And an element that is a metalloid is silicon with the chemical symbol Si. We'll finish by examining a few separation techniques too. This is because I said that a property of mixtures is that it's relatively simple to separate its constituents. This can be done with different separation techniques and the ones I'll talk about right now are filtration, distillation, phase separation and evaporation. If you filter something, you remove solid particles from a liquid phase. This is what it might look like in a lab, but this 
is decidedly more common. When you make pour over coffee, which I do recommend, you use a filter to remove the solid coffee grounds from the coffee solution. When you distill something, you use the fact that two mixed liquids have different boiling points. In a distillation apparatus like this, it is for example possible to distill alcohol from an alcohol solution since the ethanol boils at 78 degrees centigrade while the water doesn't boil until 100 degrees centigrade. You use a separation or separatory funnel like this one to separate liquids in different phases from each other. Up here there is some cooking oil and down here there is some green colored water. By opening the tap down here, you can drain the water while the cooking oil stays in the funnel. This way, you can separate the oil and the water from each other. If there is something dissolved in a liquid, like salt in water, you can also just let the water evaporate. When the water is gone, the solid substance that is left is what was dissolved in the water. In the lab, we sometimes do this with copper sulfate in a crystallizing dish to get nice copper sulfate crystals. But you can also do like this with seawater that evaporates in shallow salt pans. What's left after the water has evaporated is sea salt, which you can sell and use as a condiment to spice up your food with. For example, a nice French bouillabaisse.